Hello and welcome back everybody to session two of the EPA's Climate Change Conference 2021. I would like to just take a moment before we move to session two to introduce our first poll of the conference. So the, the question that you're all being asked today is what action would contribute most towards meeting Ireland's national climate objective for 2050? And the options that are there are decarbonisation of the electricity of electricity generation, electrification of transport, reduction of methane emissions in agriculture, improving the energy efficiency of our homes, and stepping up the planting of trees to remove CO2 from the atmosphere. So let us know what you all think, and you can now vote to the right of the screen. And um, just to introduce our second session of the day, and our chair for this event for this session is Sharon Finnegan, Director of the Office of Environmental Sustainability here in the EPA. So welcome, Sharon. Many thanks, Mary Francis, and good morning, everybody, to session two of the EPA's 2021 uh, Climate Conference. So the objective of the conference is to explore how climate neutrality can be achieved through a combination of solutions, including greenhouse gas emission reductions, carbon sequestration, technologies and behaviour change. So far this morning, we've heard about where we're at in terms of our national greenhouse gas emissions and projections, the scale of the challenge, the urgency of action required and so on. In this session, we're going to focus on the transition to climate neutrality at a national level, which has been framed within the context of the carbon budgets. So just to give you a sense of how the session is going to run, we're going to hear from our keynote speaker, Mary Donnelly, first for about 20 minutes. And then following Mary's presentation, there'll be three respondents. Each will have five minutes to speak. And then following that, we'll have a Q&A session where we'll bring everybody back in, in together. So moving on to the keynote address, um, it's the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Amendment Bill, which has now moved into the Shannon for consideration, will embed the process of carbon budgeting into law. A key enabling feature of the bill is to allow this critical piece of architecture to deliver is the role of the Climate Change Advisory Council. The bill strengthens the role of the council, tasking it with proposing a programme of three successive five-year carbon budgets to the minister. The role of the council is therefore central, and we are delighted to be joined this morning by the chair of the council, Mary Donnelly, who will give us a more in-depth insight into the role that the council will play and the process underway to deliver on this crucial piece of work. Mary is the chairperson of the Council. She spent 30 years with the European Commission, ultimately as Director of Renewables, Energy Efficiency and Innovation. Mary is also currently a member of the Governance Committee of MARI and an advisory board member of the UCD Energy Institute. So her credentials are impeccable. Um, if you have any questions for Mary, please submit them as we're going along and we'll try and get to as many uh, to, uh, at the end of the session. So welcome, Mary, and over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Sharon, and thank you very much indeed for the opportunity to have a conversation with you this morning on what I think is the seminal challenge for Ireland Inc. going forward in the next number of years. Our challenge is to deal with climate change, and I think it's very important that we really cite that in the context of our daily lives. We are working towards a better environment. We're working to reducing the negative impacts of climate change. We're working to a cleaner, healthier environment, both from the perspective of air and water. And ultimately, what we want to achieve is better lives for people in Ireland. So it, this is a very positive agenda, albeit that it is a very challenging one to deliver. And as part of that, we have set ourselves the target, as indeed have other countries in the world, of achieving net climate neutrality by 2050. And in order to get that, we've established, or we're in the process of establishing a milestone for 2030 of a 51% reduction in our emissions. It's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. Let's, let's, let's just for a moment realize where we are in terms of starting at this exercise. We are currently the second highest per capita emitter of emissions in Europe. Luxembourg is a little higher than us. We emit about 12 and a half million tonnes per capita, which is about 50% higher than the average for the EU. So we're starting to some extent on the back foot. We also have had a number of years where perhaps our progress hasn't been as positive as it should have been. So we are in the process of catch up in doing that. And in setting the target of 51% emissions, it is a very steep challenge to deliver, but when we achieve it, and I believe we will, it doesn't put us in the first place, it just puts us amongst the first. So I think we have to understand 
where we are in our starting point and where we need to be at our goal in 2030 in order to achieve our long-term objectives. And a very important element of that, of course, is that we, we need to have a consistency in approach as to how we deal with climate change. The one thing that has been shown over the last number of years that is that a stop-start approach doesn't work. We need to have a clear direction, a clear plan, clear structures in place, and we need to deliver incrementally every year in terms of moving forward. And in that context, if I just take for a moment to talk about the, the Climate Action Council itself, uh, firstly, of course, we are an independent body. And I think the independence is important because ultimately, if we are to be trusted, we must be independent and we must be seen to be independent. And I think a second very important and fundamental aspect is that the council has to be seen to be science-based. It's not politics driven, it is science-based. Our job is to gather ev evidence and to listen to everybody. And if I can take a moment to say that our current work in terms of developing the budgets, the proposals for the budgets, we have been assisted enormously. And I really have to express very sincere appreciation to all of the supports that we've gotten from academia. We've had Mara, the Institute from UCC, we've had UCD, we've had TCD, we've had Maynooth, we've had Limerick University, all contributing enormous amounts of information, time, research to our debate. And I would also say that, and indeed Sharon, this is, a, I think, a legacy of your own work, we've had excellent cooperation across government departments who have opened their own modeling systems to the council and shared their data in a very open and collaborative way. And I think this really is the mechanism that we need to build on going forward. In this process, we are all in the game. We're all on the same team and we need to be able to deliver on that. And I think it's important for the council, firstly, to be able to use that expertise, but then also to have an outreach back into our community at local level, at regional level, obviously at national level, but also have the opportunity to project Ireland to other parts of the world in terms of what we're doing, how we're doing it, and what we are achieving. Specifically on the carbon budgets, these are budgets, uh, five-year budgets, and they make sense because our ultimate target is for 2050, and that's a long time away. So it's very hard to focus minds when you're talking about achieving something by 2050. But if you say our target for 2025 is X, it's much more real. And I think people can understand that in order to achieve a target by 2025, we need to take action now. So I, I, I think the, the, the logic of having five-year carbon budgets is very solid and will help us to concentrate minds and focus our actions. As part of delivering uh, our recommendations on the five-year budgets, the Council is currently looking at a number of aspects. Uh, firstly, you know, Ireland, Ireland has made commitments at the UN level, at the Paris Agreement, uh, we are members of the EU, so we have made international commitments. And it is important that we live up to those international commitments. So we've looked at what would those international commitments mean for us? And then put that alongside what the bill is now talking about of a 51% reduction by 2030. And in fact, as it happens, the numbers marry up very well. So there isn't any, any conflict as such there. But we also need to look at taking, say, the first two budgets over the decades, this decade. How do you balance the budget in the first five years versus the second five years? And, and in that consideration, there are many aspects that we need to take account of. I think one of the most important, of course, is how are we ensuring that we have climate justice? It's absolutely essential that the budget, when it comes out, is one that is achievable, but achievable in a fair and equitable way across our society. And part of the process going forward is to ensure that those who are vulnerable, say, you know, fuel poor or other vulnerable groups, are not further marginalized by what, by what we're doing in the climate space, but indeed are supported and in that way can become part of the solution and not part of a problem out of the solution. 
we also have to think about what does it mean for our society and our economy going forward? And, you know, we're looking at issues, for example, like employment. What does, you know, a climate budget and the actions that we're going to need to take uh, for the achievement of that budget, what does it mean for employment? And it certainly looks as though it will generate jobs. That's the very positive news. It will generate jobs in a very simple way. At the moment, we spend between five and eight billion euros a year importing fossil fuels for our energy demands. <clears throat> if we can produce that on, on shore, well, indeed, in the island, be it onshore or offshore through wind and solar and other mechanisms, then we can substitute that with jobs generated in Ireland. And that's the positive news. So we, you know, when we look at the retrofit program that we have, that's a very good area for job growth across all of the country. Having said that, of course, we do have to be conscious of the fact that there are some jobs that will be in jeopardy. There are some jobs that will change either in their nature, the job will remain, but the, the skills required will need to change and therefore the upskilling will become a real issue for some people, you know, car mechanics as we move into electric uh, cars, for example, plumbers as we roll out heat pumps. And then there will be a cohort in our society where the jobs will actually disappear. And I think that's a part that we really need to focus attention on, be honest with people and make sure that we have structures in place one, to inform people, but two, to ensure that we have the supports necessary for them to retrain, reskill, and find alternative employment. So that's an important element that we're looking at as well. We're also looking at the competitiveness of the country and indeed its attractiveness, given you know, the very high levels of foreign direct investment that we have in Ireland. We have to be conscious of that. And you know, as a headline there, I think we must understand that we are, largely speaking, an exporting country. We obviously export pharmaceuticals, but we also export a very large quantity of food and food products. And we have a good image internationally. We are the Green Island. We have a very positive image in our export markets. We cannot afford to undermine that image through inaction in the space of climate. So part of what we're doing obviously is for ourselves, but it's also for our economy in terms of where we export to and what kind of image the rest of the world has of Ireland and takes that forward. And equally, competitiveness is an important issue. We have to keep that to the fore. Uh, there will be costs uh, with this, the climate actions involved, and we shouldn't underestimate them. Uh, the costs can be minimized if we plan them and implement them in a very managed way. And out of that, I think there are a number of issues that we really need to think about. Uh, specifically, how do we use our natural resources? We have the best wind onshore and offshore of any country in the European Union. And I might even go further to say, indeed, we rank in the top of the world. How are we going to use those resources? How are we going to get the maximum benefit for our economy, but also socially acceptable utilization of those resources? Are we going to be able to roll out these capture mechanisms through wind turbines, solar farms and others fast enough to achieve our targets? We're looking at at least 70% uh, zero carbon electricity by 2030. That means we need to build more onshore wind farms and we need to start our offshore wind farm industry. And we have a number of challenges in terms of rolling that out. One, and, and Niall will be on later, we have an issue with the procedures that we need to ensure are complied with in order to get environmental clearance, planning clearance, and actually get construction in place through you know, our res option systems and our market access mechanisms. And there, I think we do have an opportunity to really look at the procedures that we follow to say, can we make these procedures more streamlined? Can we make them more efficient? Can we make them more visible and accessible to the community so that they can be reassured as to what we're doing? Yes, it makes sense in a climate sense, but yes, it also means this kind of change in your community. This is what it looks like. This is what it feels like. It's not being done to you, but rather you are part of the process and that you can be a share of the benefits. You can have a share of the benefits. Um, 
if I look at how we're going to be able to achieve our climate ambitions, clearly we need the electricity system to deliver. We need this at least 70% and more if we can get it, because ultimately electricity would become the decarbonizing vector for both our transport and our heat sector. And specifically on the heat sector, when I look at our retrofit program, I think it's an excellent program. I have to say though, it's going to be very expensive. And one of the issues that perhaps we need to think about is having a hierarchical approach to how we finance and support the decarbonization of the heat system in our residential and tertiary buildings. And maybe that's something that William might be happy to take on board uh, in a few minutes. Um, one area that I'd like to also mention is specifically uh, the, the agricultural sector. Clearly, it's a big part of our economy, but it's, it's more than just our economy. It's part of us. It is our fabric. It is our culture. It is so much of our society. And the agriculture has such an opportunity in this exercise. It is perhaps the only sector that can develop and operate a sink for emissions. And the marriage of the emissions from the agricultural sector and the sink of the agricultural sector through an AFLU approach really becomes central to, to the success of our carbon, uh, our climate efforts. And, and here I'm talking about, you know, reinvesting bogs uh, and, and, you know, land use, uh, afforestation. We really need to think about very hard about how we achieve these objectives. And the other area, because it tends to be, you know, the Cinderella of the climate change action is the whole sector of adaptation. We need to be very structured in our support of adaptation to the changes because climate change is not something that's going to happen next week or next year or next decade. Climate change is happening now and the consequences of climate change need to be addressed now. How do we deal with flooding? How do we do it with more and more ferocious storms? So how do we adapt our society, our locality? And in that context, the role and the actions of local authorities through you know, the county councils, the city councils, it's fundamental in terms of ensuring that we are well prepared and adapted for the changes that are taking place. So for me, it's a very big challenge, clearly, we must operate in this space on the basis of science. That is our foundation. But it's also important that we relate science to practice, to everyday living. We, we communicate to everybody in a way that relates to their da daily lives so that they can take their own uh, actions within the context of what they do. And this needs to be supported by the policies. Government policies, government actions, government supports, are absolutely fundamental in setting the direction and supporting that journey as we go down the route of climate action and ultimately reducing our emissions. And I think maybe a final comment, if I may, in this process, I think it's very important that we can measure what we're doing. We set our milestones, we measure what we're doing, and when we have a success, let's applaud it. And I'm looking forward to lots of applause over the next number of years as we achieve our milestones in this journey. Thank you very much indeed, Sharon. Thanks a million, Marie, for that. Uh, very Lots of food for thought there, I think. Um, look, we're, we're now going to move on to the series of responses where speakers will give an overview of the sectoral ch challenges and opportunities of decarbonizing energy transport and the, improper, the importance of proper uh, planning and sustainable development as well. Um, don't forget that if you're on social media, please tag us with your hashtag Climate Conference 2021. And also just a reminder to submit any questions that you might have to the panel. Do please try to keep them relevant to this panel and indicate if your question is for one of our speakers in particular, that would be very helpful. Um, I'd now like to invite William Walsh, CEO of Sustainable uh, Energy Authority of Ireland, to give his response to Mary's presentation. William is the Chief Executive Officer in SEAI, having previously held the position of both Chief Operations Officer and Chief Financial Officer. Welcome, William, and over to you. Thanks, Sharon. <clears throat> and um, thanks, Mary. A very inspiring uh, keynote. Um, as Sharon's pointed out, my name is William Walsh, CEO of SEAI. I'm delighted to be here this morning. Uh, and thanks, thanks to the EPA for arranging and inviting me to speak. 
Um, I've entitled my piece this morning, um, Living Within Limits, the Implications of Carbon Budgets and How We Approach the Energy Transition. Um, as Mary's covered, carbon budgets are the only scientific way to approach the climate crisis. Working back from scientifically derived global carbon budgets, there are various methodologies that will enable us to derive what will be a fair share contribution from Ireland. And then we'll have to decide as to how that's divided out by the various sectors within our economy. And that's certainly going to be a challenge once we've hit, we've decided upon the number through the Climate Change Advisory Council, splitting that out uh, in, is going to be a challenge. By its very nature, a carbon budget will dictate year on year how much carbon we emit for all the activities, activities we want to get up to as a society. These are impacted by three main drivers. Driver one is our activity levels how many kilometers a year we're driving, um, the number of homes that we, we live in, the temperatures at which we um, set our homes to, the duration of our home heating, the number of products we produce, the kilos of food we produce, the liters of drink we produce, the tons of aluminium or cement that we produce. Driver two is the efficiency of the technology we use to undertake all of our activities. So examples of that is are our cars, um, an electric vehicle versus an internal combustion engine. Um, the BER, another example of efficient technology is the BER of our homes. Driver three is the carbon intensity of the fuels used for these activities. So for energy, renewables obviously being the best, then we have varying degrees of badness in relation to the, to the fossil fuels we will use um, for our energy. This, this outlines that it's, it, it proves us, shows us that it's clear where policy options exist to reduce carbon. Um, policy option one, we can improve the efficiency of our technology. Examples are we can fully upgrade our homes and insulate them to an A, an a rated home or building. Um, we can make sure that we have efficient appliances in our home or lighting products uh, and efficiently designed industrial motor or air filtration unit. And we've many more examples of where technology, efficient technology can assist in decarbonization of the energy sector. Policy option two is reducing carbon intensity of the fuels that we use to drive these, these technologies. Essentially that mean, means substituting fossil fuels with renewables. And policy options three, um, we reduce our activity levels. Um, and this is, this is the behavioral one. Um, we can travel less and walk or cycle more um, we can work from home, we can staycation instead of taking flights. In some situations, we may be able to heat our homes a little less, wear more clothes if we don't need, need heating. So that concept of energy sufficiency, and this is kind of a novel, not novel, but it's, a, it's kind of delving deeper into, into the use of energy. And, you know, do we need, um, what sized homes do we need? And it's a more difficult conversation to have, but it's something that um, our citizens need to consider in relation to, 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 the, to the use of energy. We can also consider the making of less products that we, ca that we can't currently make without emitting, without emitting a lot of carbon until such a time as, as we can make the volumes we want within our carbon budgets. Based on the game-changing levels of technology change that are going to be required to become very efficient, energy efficient in our con economy, and to go very big on renewables, it appears to me, based on, on the imperative to reduce net emissions by 7% each year, and remember that's something we've done in 2020 only because of the severe limitations opposed on us by the pandemic, we will increasingly need to consider our options around our activity levels across all sectors to give us the headroom on annual carbon budgets. This is going to mean some very difficult but necessary choices. And if we don't make them early, we will run out of choices or options. In energy, basically, we need to get out of fossil fuels as quickly as possible. I have every confidence that if we put the right structures and incentives in place, that we can continue to lead on renewable electricity with 70% renewables and possibly beyond but before 2030. And Niall is going to cover off on the consenting in relation to planning in that space um, for, for la later in the session. On transport, biofuel blendings will likely get us to our 2020 targets in that sector. But going deeper, we need almost immediately to shift to EVs uh, to use renewable electricity. 
on heat, and Mary mentioned this, um, our upcoming heat study will show that we need to go big on new technologies for Ireland like district heating. And that certainly will help in relation to the number of homes, the, the way in which we get homes to be too. The heat study will highlight the significant potential to electrify industrial heat demand and the need to get off oil in the residential sector and ultimately gas via heat pumps and then gas and oil primarily via district heating where that solution makes sense. And there's a lot more options besides. The results of our national heat project will become available soon in, com in the coming months, and that will help to inform the way in which we will approach our 500,000 B2s to 2030. So to conclude, I think what's most powerful about the carbon budget framing is that it spells out explicitly the limits in which we can operate so that we can make our contribution to a habitable planet. Modelling to illustrate the technology transition needed to stay under those budgets will bring out a stark reality that a reorientation of our economy to prioritise renewables, energy and efficiency will be needed. And more than that, if we can't deploy the technology quickly enough, we will have to look in the immediate term at options to curtail activities that would see us ex exceed our carbon budgets. It's been clear for some time now that we need to the kind of national movement at the scale of our response to COVID-19 to pull together and do our bit for future generations. My sense is that government understand this and that we're going to work as hard as we, and we are going to work as hard as we can with them and others to find ways to keep us under what will be very challenging carbon budgets when they're set out by the process currently underway. I want to thank you and wish you the best for the rest of the day. The conference gen, uh, agenda looks very interesting and engaging, and I look forward to taking questions at the end of uh, the speaker session this morning. Thank you, Sharon. Thanks very much for that, William. Yeah, it's a really interesting, uh, like challenging pieces there, but thought provoking as well, just around that national movement that's required. So really, really grateful for that, William. Thank you. Please continue to submit questions for, for Mary and for William and for all our speakers. We'll be answering those at the end of the session. Just a reminder as well to vote on our poll. The question being, what action would contribute the most towards meeting Ireland's national climate objections for 2050? Let us know your thoughts on that. I now want to invite Niall Cusson, Chief Executive and Planning Regulator, Office of the Planning Re uh, Regulator, to give his response to, to Mary's presentation. Niall is the Chief Executive there um, of the Regulator, which was established by government back in April 2019. And prior to his appointment, Niall was Chief Planner at the Department of Housing, Planning and Local Government from July 2014, having also worked in the Department from January 20 to 2000 uh, in a number of professional planning roles. So welcome, Niall, and over to you. Thanks very much, Sharon, and thanks to the EPA for the invitation and indeed uh, to Mary for a fantastic keynote, as always, and, uh, and William's uh, response there. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the planning process, which has been flagged there. And indeed, it may come as a surprise um, to some listening in that since 2010, the Planning Act has already required local authorities in their forward planning to adopt settlement and uh, development strategies that reduce future patterns of energy consumption, that shift our present energy needs towards renewable sources and that adapt to climate changes already happening. And I'm going to look at, about, uh, at past performance and future requirements in relation to these. So historically, disconnects between our capital investment and future uh, spatial planning approaches have to supported a model of national development that has hardwired us into a very energy intensive, car dependent and carbon intensive way of life. As Mary has mentioned, um, our numbers, they're not very good. And looking back, uh, the zoning of land for development has been predominantly market led rather than plan led and roads rather than public transport led. But change is afoot. Um, the government's national planning framework, as part of the National Development Plan and Project Ireland 2040, commits to securing an average of 40% of all new homes on, for example, infill and redevelopment land within our cities and towns. However, uh, just reflecting on the fact that the overwhelming uh, proportion of housing being delivered now is taking place on greenfield land, and indeed near 30% of our total housing delivery every year is in the form of one-off housing in the countryside, um, that's going to be a tall order. So implementing the National Planning Framework demands visionary planning supported by massive political will to tackle issues such as revisiting suburban carbon intensive planning and zoning in favor of fresh approaches to existing urban areas in terms of the density, the form, the height of development and so on. 
31 local authorities are rewriting their plans now to implement the NPF, and many local authorities are working hard on climate action centre planning policy, whilst also pointing out to the fact that brownfield and higher density development is often much less economic compared to lower density greenfield development. And indeed, there are man many vested interests uh, and sometimes communities too, who want to hold on to the traditional model, um, which unfortunately is very, very carbon intensive. Um, seeing that I suppose the pragmatism of meeting current housing needs should trump, you know, I suppose the achievement of longer term climate or sustainable development options. Now, huge work has been undertaken by um, the board, local authorities and many other stakeholders in establishing a bank, a reservoir, if you like, of planning permissions in good locations from a carbon climate perspective, like city centres and where there's public transport and so on. But it is the fact that many developers say these are not viable to commence, as in Cork's Docklands, for example. Um, turning around the affordability and viability of large scale housing delivery within our city and town centres is absolutely critical if planning is to deliver on climate. And if the activation of climate friendly vacant development lands isn't happening, then we're going to need the Land Development Agency currently being legislated for by government and the Arctis and well-resourced local authorities with the powers, the resources, the, the people to intervene and make things happen. In the transport area, which is a huge part of our carbon addiction, spatial planning policies are very influential in determining transport patterns. The less we spread out, travel lowers, and so do energy needs and emissions. We need to reflect on the fact that between 2016 and 2020, about a third of all the new homes, excluding apartments, granted planning permission and actually built in this country, nearly 26,000 to be precise, were one-off homes in the countryside, largely, that depend heavily on car-based transport, individual fossil fuel heating systems, and very energy intensive supply lines for the services to sustain them, waste management, school transport, so on and so forth. Again, government is signaling a new direction and is making unprecedented investments in transport, which much more uh, to come. The planning process also has a huge role in proactively sourcing renewable energy sources. Generating 70% of electricity from renewable sources by 2030 could mean delivering four gigawatts of renewable electricity onshore. And we need to analyze how every county in the country could play its part in delivering that and more with offshore wind to a carbon-free society by 2050. A national renewable energy roadmap drawn up by national agencies, regional assemblies and local authorities, all working together, could draw up these county-specific targets, which could then be matched to the designation of sustainable energy zones by local authorities in their development plans, where community wind, solar and other renewable sources could play their part in enabling electrification of our mobility, home heating and wider economic systems. Four gigawatts is very achievable onshore if we put our minds to it and it's just the first step as we bring a medium to longer term maritime renewable resource ashore, as Mary mentioned earlier. So just to wrap up, working within a clear scientifically grounded policy approach and with the economic and community engagement pieces addressed, our planning process has a key role and is ready to play a key role in real climate action. As Laura Burke highlighted yesterday, you know, we have to uh, achieve a significant and immediate decrease um, in the uh, level of greenhouse gas emissions that, that we, are, we, are, we are emitting. Um, I absolutely agree with Laura and indeed Mary Donnelly's presentation earlier. I hope the contribution today informs maybe some of the discussions and the, the questions afterwards, which I very much look forward to. Thank you. Thanks very much, Niall. Uh, that's very interesting insights there, particularly just around maybe the difficulties around getting people around to this way of thinking. When you think about that, that requirement being in the Planning Act since 2010, food for thought there. So look, uh, just to encourage people to continue to submit questions, some excellent questions coming in. And also don't forget if you're on social media, please tag us with our hashtag Climate Conference 2021. Our final respondent this afternoon is uh, Hannah Daly. Um, who is Dr. Hannah Daly, who is from the Marai Research Centre in Cork. She's a lecturer in energy systems in modelling in UCC and leads research on long-term climate mitigation pathways. Uh, prior to returning to UCC, her alma mater, she worked at the International Energy Agency, leading the agency's work on the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, welcome, Hannah, and over to you. 
Uh, thank you very much, Sharon, and good morning. It's a pleasure to join you all this morning from rural West Cork. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. So the EPA projections published yesterday should be a stark wake up call. So even with half a million EVs by 2030 in the with existing measure scenario, emissions and transport basically flatline. Reaching the full target of nearly a million EVs would reduce uh, transport emissions by less than a quarter relative to 2018, only half of what we need. Moreover, meeting that target could require doubling of EV sales every year, which is not impossible, but it would require sustained subsidies and a much faster rolling out of charging infrastructure. The same can be said across all of the sectors. The key measures in the 2019 Climate Action Plan were about doing basically the same thing that we do now, but with a, lower, uh, but with a switch to low carbon technologies. So meeting the targets for EVs, heat pumps, wind and solar, they're all both extremely challenging, probably about the limit of what is achievable, given the, the, the scale of rollout needed, while being essential to meeting our decarbonisation targets. But at the same time, they're not enough. They will only take us about halfway to meeting our 2030 target. So what the EPA projections show us is that to meet our Paris Agreement commitments, we have to look beyond technology switches alone. So in the Energy Policy Modelling Group at the Mari Centre in UCD, uh, UCC, sorry, we do whole energy systems modelling with the Times Ireland model to examine integrated pathways to meeting climate targets for transport, heat and electricity. So the analysis we're undertaking now to support the, the Climate Council's carbon budget process is reinforcing the message that relying on technology and fuel switches alone, basically doing the same thing, but with different technologies, is a poor choice. We'll risk making energy more expensive, less reliable, and maybe need to switch from imported oil, for example, to imported biofuel. In later decades, it would require us also to move to uh, negative emissions technologies like biomass with carbon and capture and storage. These are all problematic and could lead to unintended consequences. But what we have been developing is a new scenario uh, for energy systems models called a low energy demand scenario. And this illustrates how much easier and cheaper meeting uh, our climate targets can be if we focus on the structural drivers of demand. But first, we need to understand what are the structural drivers of demand, how are policies, practices, institutions and interests driving these demands. For example, in transport, the number of cars on our road has tripled since 1990, three times the number of cars on the road since, uh, since 1990 now. Remarkably, road traffic deaths and air pollution have actually decreased very significantly since then, but CO2 emissions have grown nearly as fast as the size of the car fleet, and cars are getting bigger and more powerful. SUVs make up half of new car sales now, up from around 13% a decade ago, and SUV sales far outstrip those of EVs. So while cars are getting somewhat more efficient, the savings are far outstripped by the growth in demand. If we simply switch uh, petrol SUVs with electric SUV sales, it will reduce emissions, but it can also cause problems. For example, uh, electricity demand can double relative to 2030 as a whole relative to 2018, which will make decarbonizing and ensuring the reliability of the grid very difficult. So we have to tackle demand. In UCC, we're also developing models to understand how and why we travel and how this is driving emissions. For example, many trips are for the school run and my eldest is starting primary school in September, so this is the top of my mind. So in 1986, less than a quarter of primary school students travel to school by car. That share is now 60% and increasing all the time. For secondary school students, the share has increased from 11% to 42%, and only 2% of secondary school students now cycle to school. By 1986, actually more uh, students cycled than went to school by car. This isn't a surprise. We've devoted so much of our public realm to cars that it's hostile to people, especially children. So in my local village near Kinsale in County Cork, there's no footpath to the local school, and this is not an outlier. You know, this is not a radical trans uh, transformation I'm talking about. This is simply footpath space for people. And I'm very glad that Niall in the previous intervention very succinctly covered the need to make our spatial development and planning systems compatible with sustainable transport. And while urban cycling and infrastructure deservedly gets lots of attentions, we need to make cycling and public transport the default choice in, in cities. We also need to look at, at, uh, at rural bike networks, which are in many countries uh, uh, feasible to, to, to cycle over long distances safely by car. But it's very important also that this transition is fair. Um, with structural changes uh, of the scale required, we have to be upfront that there'll be winners and losers. We have to use a combination of carrot and stick approaches uh, to, to, to reach the target and the transition won't be fair and it won't be feasible if rich people get all the carrot and poor people get all the stick. Uh, for example, should we be subsidizing Teslas, which are the uh, second most um, popular EV models sold in 2020. And the same can be said for subsidizing heat pumps and retrofits. We have to make sure that the rewards and the pain are distributed fairly. 
So to conclude, the 2030 decarbonisation target we've committed to will be the great mission of this decade, and it is absolutely essential uh, that we meet this to be consistent with our Paris Agreement targets. If we get it right, the prize is huge, but only if we manage to treat this grand challenge uh, uh, collectively with other grand challenges we face uh, instead of in silos. I'm talking about housing, transport, health, uh, and biodiversity. And so there's a saying um, that the best time to plant an oak tree was 100 years ago. But the second best time to plant an oak tree is now. So we don't have the luxury of a time machine to go back and fix these bad choices that we are made in the past. But we do have an incredible window of opportunity now to do something transformational, which hopefully future generations will thank us for. So thank you very much. I'm looking forward to the, the Q&A session and back to you, Sharon. Thanks very much, uh, Hannah. Very um useful I think there to, to bring some of this down to the brass tacks you know some of those challenges that we're experiencing in our everyday lives and how they influence our own thinking as 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 people working in in this space and um, I now invite uh, Mary Hannah William and Niall to join me on the screen uh, and we begin to look and respond to some of the questions posed by our audience please do continue to submit those questions or upvote the questions that you like and we'll get to as many of those as we can over the next 15 minutes or so. Great, thanks very much and welcome back everybody. I think what we might do is just start uh, with a question that's come in from Niall McAvoy just about the, the, the bill itself. And this one, I think probably for, for you, Mary, if you don't mind, the bill he says contains phrases such as, insofar as practical in several sections, for example, a minister of the government shall insofar as practical uh, perform his or her functions in a manner consistent with the carbon budget. To what extent uh, would such wording limit the efficacy of carbon budgets proposed by the council? Well, I think it's fair to say that uh, when you draft a piece of legislation uh, and part of the requirement of the legislation is to make a subjective assessment, you need to have, let's call it, let's call it basically weasel words that allows some sort of assessment to be made at the time. So, for example, uh, you know, if, if a minister was to consider something back in 2017, and the same question came up in 2020, it's very possible that the answer would not be entirely the same because the environment that we were operating in in 2017 is, was very different to the environment in 2020. So you, it's very hard to write legislation today in the absolute sense without having full understanding, obviously, of what's going to happen into the future. So for me, when I read legislation, and indeed I drafted much of it when I was with the commission, it's very, very important that you have a, a result that you want to achieve. It is the result that has to be delivered. The process of delivering this can be adaptable to the circumstances that you find in at the time. But the key issue is to deliver the result. And I think in the bill, there is great clarity on the result that has to be achieved. And you know, we will be able to take necessary flexibilities if for in the morning, for example, in the morning, we found that you know, uh, we discovered a new source of heat for our heating, heating our houses, well, then we should be able to do that. But the key issue is to maintain very clearly front and center, what is the result that we want to achieve and what's the time scale for achieving that. Thanks, Mary. Um some interesting questions coming in on energy and, and there's two maybe one on supply and one on demand in relation to energy from gary fitzpatrick he asks nuclear power could provide heat fuel and electricity for decades with virtually no co2 a theoretically lower financial and material costs than any alternative and could be deployed faster does the panel think the policy on nuclear energy should be reconsidered and maybe just linking link link to that slightly in relation to the the, the demand uh, a question in from David Hines. Data centres use copious amounts of electricity. Do we consider this increased demand of power for data centres when considering our national policies going forward? 
And I, I'll open that one up. Maybe Mary or Hannah or William, William might want to say something. William, do you see with your hand up there? Yeah, I might just make some high level points. And, and indeed, I know Mary from her, from, from her European past and indeed her, her work she's doing at the moment. And certainly Hannah uh, would have probably have uh, contributions to make here as well. Just in relation to, to nuclear, I mean, government policy on nuclear is 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 clear. Um, and I guess it's considered in around uh, around issues such as safety and um, and indeed you know capacity to supply energy um, and whole of life carbon. So I guess from my perspective, really we have a significant resource that um, I think that we need to focus our efforts in in exploiting um you know our offshore wind resource um, and building out the receiving infrastructure and the storage infrastructure for for that i think that's really um you know that that that's 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 uh, i suppose the, the in relation to nuclear in relation to data centers there's um undoubtedly the growth of data centers is is, is going to be a challenge to the um to the energy system the electricity system and um, there's a cru consultation under the way with a number of options and um, it's been considered by by government at the moment in the sense of of security supply and um, and again i mean there's 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 advantages and disadvantages that have to be balanced up and um, mm. how have we all managed to work from home over the last 15 months um and what have been the emission savings in relation to that and what has supported that so um and then again i mean and then again we've if we look at the level of of um proposed data center development between now and 2030 it 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 it, 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 it create a significant challenge in relation to where that energy is going to come from so that all needs to be considered in the round um, and i understand that that's happening at the moment um through through consultation with cru and, and indeed um through um government policy consideration um so they're my two uh contributions in relation to those two questions thanks very much thanks william hannah thanks sharon two great questions firstly insights from our our latest uh, times analysis shows that meeting the 2030 target without with data center demand growth with underlying electricity growth and a switch uh, from heat and transport uh, to electricity could double electricity demand it's very hard to see how we can ensure a kind of a low carbon and resilient grid with a doubling of demand so quickly so so uh, so, so that's certainly of concern on nuclear in energy systems models like the ones that we run, if you just simply put in nuclear, it, it would actually really, really like nuclear. It's a, it's, a, it's a good option. But our models need to also consider social and political and sort of societal feasibility. Um, first of all, is, is nuclear a good fit for our grid as it currently stands? Maybe with the advent of, of small modular reactors in the coming decades, uh, it, it will be possible, but those aren't uh, commercially available now. Um, but, but largely it's the, it's the wider sort of time scale that's needed uh, to, 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 make, uh, to, make, to make these um, these choices. So I, I also teach first year energy engineers and we run a debate with them on, uh, on whether nuclear is a good option. And many think that nuclear is, is a clear choice, you know, zero carbon, you know, lots of power but when they consider all of the trade-offs and the societal and the and the, the kind of the the safety and and political feasibility they 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 uh, tend to switch their minds so it's it's not a straightforward um question thanks anna thanks that's, that's great um a couple of questions in for, for you niall on the planning side one from karen mahan will the planning regs and county development plans change to reflect the imperative to prioritize climate change adaptation overall over all other interests, for example, or i.e. will housing developments going forward be required to meet a standard to achieve emissions targets related to the to the sector limits on embedding carbon and materials, for example, integrating transport and housing. And then another one just in relation to onshore renewables, is there going to be a push to tighten up statutory timeframes for decisions to be made by onboard Planola for SID, S SID applications and appeals? There's been a huge lag over the past number of years, which has held up the deliverability of many mm. projects. Mm. And actually, maybe Sharon, starting with the timeline piece, uh, you know, um, I, I think we just need to be careful about um, language about tightening up timelines for for 
um, you know, making decisions on particular projects. You know, we've seen a very high level of litigation, a very high level of challenge, and, you know, I suppose an increasing proportion of cases that um, ultimately are overturned by the courts, very often on uh, procedural points um, that may have their origins in, you know, trying to make decisions within quite compressed timeframes. And the, the other piece about it is that um, a lot of the challenges may be in a community sense, in a social sense, arise around a, a lack of buy-in to what the vision for development of a particular area um, is in. Uh, is. So I, I think it's very important that the and that this was the message, I think, of my my contribution that we 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 double down on and and very much more focus on getting community engagement and buy in using all sorts of new um, engagement uh, systems, three dimensional modeling, and so on, um, at the development plan stage. You know, so people understand the connect between, you know, protesting on the street about climate. And you know the the actions that we're going to have to be responsible for, accountable for in our own lives and where we live and how our communities are going to evolve uh, in actually addressing that climate challenge. And the, and the local authority development plan is actually the forum where a lot of that issue needs to be teased out, but we're not seeing that sufficiently. Um, yeah. And that maybe brings me to the, 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 the earlier um, point. Um, there are local authorities that are now really grappling with this. Um, uh, you know, local authorities in the southeast using the, their energy agencies are now, you know, mapping out, you know, their carbon budgets, they're, the curve that they're on presently and the curve they need to be on in the context of climate neutrality and trying to map that across then to choices they're making in terms of where housing or employment or other forms of development are located in the future. And indeed, how they, um, if you like, uh, can use the planning process to bring attention or focus on the retrofitting of existing communities and so on. We have the, the um, Decarbonizing Towns Initiative, for example, coming very, very soon um, and, uh, and rolled out uh, across the country. But, but there are other local authorities and communities where you know, there's, a, there's a sort of a desire to hold on to maybe more traditional patterns of, 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 of development and, a, and a, you know, a lack of maybe certainty or confidence in relation to embracing you know, the, the, the climate challenge. In other words, the development plan that has lots of you know, lofty aspirations about action on climate, but very, very few measurable actions that you know, roadmap you out in terms of what, what will be the tons per head, for example, of carbon emissions of the new forms of development, et cetera, that are going to take place in the county as a result of the development plans out into the future. So we're part of the oversight process of that. Great, thanks, Niall. Loads of questions. Loads of questions coming in there, and I am conscious of time, but there's one uh, in particular here for, for Mary from Philip Highland, uh, just around the target around 500,000 retrofitted homes and 600,000 heat pumps. Uh, and, and Philip says, we are currently in the midst of a housing crisis, so the lack of supply, affordability and a lack of skilled labour. Labour, are you aware of any firm, brackets, finance plans to upskill the people required to retrofit climate justice aspects of these targets must be addressed. Are you aware of any plans to offer ultra, any ultra long term uh, loans in the area? And maybe William might like to come in on this one, too. But Mary, I'll go to you first. Uh, yes, thanks, Sharon. And thanks for the question. Uh, first of all, the, 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 this is a very significant question for Ireland. And if I take, first of all, the retrofits and the number of retrofits, uh, the capacity demand for those retrofits is high and is a challenge in our current labour force. And when you put it alongside the capacity demands for new builds, it really becomes a serious challenge for us. Uh, one, of, one of the issues that has occurred as a consequence of the, the COVID was when we shut down construction, um, some of, shall we say, the non-Irish elements of our construction and labour force, decided to go home and ended up being at home for a lot longer than anybody had thought at the beginning. And we haven't necessarily got those back. So we, we are deficient in our capacity, our resource capacity to achieve these objectives. And that's one of the reasons why, and, and this is what I've been talking to William about, is why perhaps we need to be very, very focused in terms of how we deliver on our retrofits and maybe have a hierarchy in terms of our heat. So by that, I mean, if you have an alternative mechanism, let's say if the district heating is coming down the track and it's going to be 100 metres from your house, well, then 
is it appropriate to retrofit your heating system today into a heat pump or would it be better to spend that effort and that money on a property that won't have access to an alternative system such as heat district heating and invest there? So I think part of the policy is to be very smart with what in, in the end of the day is limited resources, both you know, capacity, human capacity and financial to achieve the maximum result from the effort. And when I talk about finance, yes, there are a number of initiatives coming down the track in terms of uh, low interest finance, long term finance to be available for the retrofit. We can start to see some of the models coming out with the retail banks, but there will be others. There are a number of others that are currently in development that will be available over the next period. Thanks, Mary. William. So thank you, um, Sharon. So just in relation to that, to that low interest finance, the as part of the Resilience and Recovery Fund, I understand government have 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 lo- looked to secure a low interest rate for for retrofit um, in and around three and a half percent. Um, so which is a, which is a game changing rate. I know it's not ultra low in the kind of PCP finance world of cars and that, but it's 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 it certainly is seen by the finance industry as a as a, as a game changer in that space. Um, so and indeed, you know, when we talk about, um, I suppose just transition fuel poverty like some of the carbon tax a significant element of the carbon tax has been um hypothecated by government to to address fuel poverty and to retrofit the homes of those in the in in in, fuel, in, in what is described or what can be termed fuel poverty so there is an element of, of that just transition piece happening there um in relation to skills um it is undoubtedly like i have a significant challenge to deliver 500,000 homes to, to, to 2030. And indeed, we're going to do it in a smart way. Um, and Mary has, you know, has, has I've had conversations with Mary in relation to this, to do it in a smart way, you, you base it on evidence, the evidence in relation to the heat studies on the way. And it's fi- it's some really interesting findings there. Um, and some of the stuff that Mary suggested has been coming through in, in, in the heat study. So maybe we just needed to talk to Mary and not do the heat study, but this is evidence-based as, as opposed to, so I guess, um, you know, so, and, and then the other piece is pilots and trials around retrofit. So, um, you know, we, we need to continue to do that to figure out the, the best way to continue forward with the bigger numbers uh, but the biggest challenge of all in relation to retrofit is skills okay and you know the great thing though in relation to that is that if you want something done um, the private sector are a very good place to start um, and they're a signal to us and certainly a signal from the Department of, of, of Skills that who have who have a working group on the future of skills needed for, for, for climate and the green economy and that so and are doing a lot of work with ourselves and a lot of work with industry in identifying the the types of skills that are needed, which are primarily in in more apprentices, but also upskilling the existing trades that exist to to in, allow them to use to, 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 heat, to use heat pumps and we're working with the likes of skills net and that's so, so a lot of work undergoing underway in that but it certainly is the very good question because it's one of the big challenges we're wrestling with at the moment and we'll continue to to try to drive um an improvement in the skills available to retrofit and indeed that, that the new housing market as well because that's you know that's a that's a second um storm on the way i guess in terms of the, the the resource that's required to continue to deliver the numbers that are required for, for for the state as well that's great thanks william there's loads of great questions coming in there but i think we're going to have to draw it to a close and um, there is a very popular question uh, on agriculture and i just encourage um the person who's made the submission on it just to hold it over for the next session um, I think it'll be very welcome a part of the discussion there. So I think, look, we could agree that the carbon budget topic, we could do a whole conference on that carbon budget talk, topic based on that. Uh, I think the insights today provided by the panellists in particular clearly demonstrate that the budget must be based on, you know, detailed research and analysis um, where the, the, you know, the, the implications for the sector are te- carefully teased out. I really want to thank Mary Donnelly for her informative, engaging keynote address and to the three panellists, William, Niall and Hannah, for giving us such informed and diverse perspectives on some of the complexities and indeed the interdependencies which are at play as we consider this process. And finally, just want to thank the audience for the participation today. It is challenging in this online environment, but I think you've risen to the, the challenge and given us all plenty of food for thought. 
And I've no doubt that it sparked ideas for further conversations, which is, of course, the whole purpose of these events. I would therefore conclude this, the session and just to confirm that we'll reconvene for session three at 12 o'clock. We'll take a short comfort break now and begin again. In the meantime, please check out um, our uh, ex exhibition space, a graphic recording, speaker biographies and the other resources that are there and continue to use the hashtag Climate Conference 2021. So just to confirm, back at 12 p.m. for session three and don't forget to click on the session three link to join us. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye.